We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. The book of John chapter 14. I want to continue talking to you about kingdom living and kingdom life, what it really looks like on a daily basis outside the walls of the church. How can we know and recognize that we're really disciples of Jesus Christ? So you've noticed, if you've been here any time at all, I really don't use the word Christian much because it's way overused and it has not a lot of meaning. I like to use the term believers. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has forgiven us and saved us. He has become our King of kings and our Lord of lords. We are believers. And in John chapter 14 through chapter 17, we find a segment of time that's between the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane. And during that period of time, we don't know how long it was, but a period of hours, Jesus stripped away all the parables, removed all the hyperbole, and spoke in plain words to his disciples. And in those three chapters of Scripture, we find our marching orders. We find the definition of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true believer in Jesus Christ. So when we look at this passage of Scripture, last week we talked about the fact that when we're true disciples, believers, we live in community and we live in unity. And we need to practice that every single day of our lives. Now listen to me. Because we live in community and live in unity doesn't mean that we don't sometimes clash. Doesn't mean that sometimes we don't need to have a come to Jesus meeting. You know what I mean? At times we have to do that. But because I love you, because I care about you, because you love me and care about me, we are willing to risk what could happen for what we know God can do. See, because when we live in community and we love one another, then we love each other enough to correct one another, to rebuke one another. To say, hey, let's let's take another look at this. Maybe you're not seeing things quite correctly. Amen? And that doesn't just apply to you sitting in the seat. That applies to me as well. Every one of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ and believers in Him have to acknowledge we are living under His authority. We are living under His commands and in His kingdom. And no man can say, I don't need your input into my life. And when we really boil this down and begin thinking about how do we live as believers and what did Jesus say in these passages that changes our life in an astounding, dynamic way, We have to say, first and foremost, He changes our priorities. He changes what's important to us. I mean, think about it. If your house is on fire and you have the opportunity to run back in and snatch just one thing, what would it be? Because that one thing is your priority. That one thing is what means the most to you. If you were stranded on an island in the South Pacific, just you, and you could only have one thing, What would that one thing be? Because that's your priority. That's what means the most to you. That's what drives you. That's what gives you life, that one thing. Everybody has priorities, but sometimes they're not real obvious. Sometimes our priorities become clouded by non-essentials. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes we allow things to become inverted because we get busy with life and we find ourselves doing things that really just don't matter in light of eternity. To use the old expression, we get caught in the rat race. And we find ourselves going around and around and around and around and making no progress. Could be that this generation, that's maybe one of the reasons this generation is one of the most medicated generations ever in the history of mankind. But when we begin to eliminate non-essentials from our life, we discover what truly defines us. That's what Jesus is talking about in these verses of Scripture. What truly defines us. Look at John 14 with me. We're going to read verses 15 through 17 for our text. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray the Father, he'll give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
I want you to hear that one more time. Jesus began that conversation by saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you read through these passages, you'll find five times he says the same thing. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. If you love me, follow my sayings. Five times in this very short span of time, Jesus said, if you love me, do what I've asked you to do. So when I think about living in the kingdom and kingdom life, I realize that once we're in community and in unity through Jesus Christ, we have an obligation. I started to say responsibility, but that's not strong enough. Obligation to obey the commands of Jesus Christ, to do what he told us to do, to be who he calls us to be. We have an obligation to obedience. I can remember when I was a kid, I was probably 13 years old, and most of you know I grew up on a farm in western Oklahoma. My dad had to work a full-time job in order to support us and keep food on the table, so the farm work fell to mom and the kids. And I, I was probably 13, I don't remember exactly, but dad had had some trees cleared so he could have more farmland. And out there, they use a bulldozer, they push the trees off, they pile them up in windrows, you burn them, but you still have a problem in that land because the roots of those trees are still there. So they come in with a deep plow, about three foot deep, pull it behind that bulldozer, and they cut every root off under the ground. And you would think that would do it, but no, because the roots are still there, and those roots will tear up tractors, they'll go through tractor tires, they tear up discs, they tear up drills, so you have to pull them all out. We called it picking up stumps. And I'll never forget the day Dad said to me, today... You're going to go out in that west pasture, and you're going to pick up stumps all day. Let me tell you something. That's a hot job. That's a dirty job. That's a back-breaking job. I hated picking up stumps. The only thing I had worse than that was picking cotton. It's worse, too. I hated picking up stumps. Well, I knew that he had already mentioned sometime in the next few days we need to go cultivate the cotton. Well, I knew if I could cultivate the cotton, I was on the tractor. Had a shade over my head. Had a jug of cool water I could drink from any time. And it was something I could see immediate results from. So I made the decision at 13, I'm not listening to my dad. I'm going to do what I want to do. So I gassed the tractor up, took it over to the cotton field, and I cultivated that whole field that day. Man, it was pristine. Not a weed left in it. And I thought when he got home, he would be so happy because I did something that needed to be done. But the reverse was actually true. You could say the Board of Education met the seat of understanding that day. <laughs> because I didn't do what he told me to do. I did what I wanted to do. Did it need to be done? Sure, it needed to be done. But it was not what he told me to do. Here's the application. How many times do we see our service rather than our obedience? I did what I wanted to do. I was serving you. I was doing something for you, but it's not what he asked you to do. You see, you can work in kid power and not love your neighbor. You can work in the nursery and not care about kids. You can be involved in worship and not let God change your heart so that worship translates to your daily life. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Five times. He didn't say, if you love me, do something for me. You notice that? Because we do something for him. Well, Lord, don't I get credit for coming to church this morning? It was really cold when I got up, and I'd have rather stayed under the covers. Sorry, no credit for that. Well, Lord, don't I get credit because that preacher made us stand up and sing again, and I actually sang this time. Sorry, no credit for that. You see, we want our service to be credited as our obedience and it just doesn't work that way. Jesus said, if you love me, do what I've asked you to do. You'll see an illustration of this in the Old Testament. When Saul was anointed king of Israel, at some point in his reign in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Samuel the prophet gave him an assignment from God, and the assignment was to destroy the Amalekites because of the history they had with Israel and the deception that had occurred. God said, we're going to set this wrong right once and for all. So when you read the story, Saul took the army, they conquered them, but he didn't do what God told him to do. He went part of the way. He didn't go all the way. 
Oh, somebody needs to hear me this morning because I'm reading your mail. You went part of the way, but you never bought in and went all the way to where you can say, I will obey your commands because I love you. See, some of us obey the commands because we're feared of the repercussions. Oh, if I don't do this, this is going to happen. If I don't do this, if I don't obey, this may come up on me. Some calamity may hit me. Would you get out of that stinking religious thinking and recognize I serve Jesus because he loves me and because he's changed me and given me hope and life. It's not out of duty. It's not out of obligation. It's not out of service. It's because I love him. I do what he asked me to do. So that's where we have to come. Until we recognize there's a difference, we will do the same thing Saul did. We'll take God's plan and tweak it. That's what he did. He tweaked it. He made it just a little bit better from his point of view. Have you ever done that? Well, I'll be the first to admit I have. We all do it because we're human. Because we lose sight of the fact that God really does know more than we know. I know that's a shock to some of you. But he really does know more than you know. He really does know more than I know. You see, we have to come to the place where we love Him so we obey His commandments and we simply follow Him. Whether we understand it, whether we can see the end from the beginning, whether we understand why we're walking through it, it really doesn't matter. He loves me, and because He loves me, He has my best in mind, and if I love Him, I'm going to follow Him. It's that simple. Boil it down, I just preached the entire message. We can say amen and go home. If I love him, I'm going to do what he asked me to do. Saul tweaked the plan. He said, well, I destroyed all but the very best. And then these people, that's what we do when we substitute service for obedience. We blame somebody else. These people did this. Come on, have you ever been there? Really, God, it wasn't my fault. This person influenced me. They told me it'd be okay. They encouraged me to do it. No, God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. Doesn't matter if your hair lips the Pope. It just doesn't matter. If you love me, keep my commandments. So this is what Samuel said. You obeyed? Why then do I hear the oxen and the sheep if you obeyed? And then he made this statement, for obedience is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of the rams. And then listen, this is where it really gets wild. This is where it really rocks our boat. He said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry. So now ask yourself, how many times has my rebellion separated me from what God's best is for my life? How many times has my insistence on knowing what's best kept me from receiving what's best? Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. You see, if we understand kingdom living then we understand there is a king who is the ultimate authority. That every rule, every regulation, every edict flows from him to us. And as believers, we understand Jesus Christ is that king. He is that ultimate authority. And every edict, every command, everything he wants us to do flows from him, then down to us. We live under his authority, under his guidelines, and because we choose to do that, we live in His blessing. Let me tell you something. The commands of God are not restrictive, but they're in fact liberating. It allows us to shake off and shed those things that have held us back for so long. When we understand, when I step into obedience, the door of blessing flows wide open. The door of favor flows wide open. The door of God's presence flows wide open when I step into obedience. But if I refuse to step into obedience, if I stay over here in service, I go to church, I give my time, I volunteer at the food pantry, I give sacks of groceries to the homeless when I see them on the street corner, whatever your excuse of service is, if you stay there, you will never move into the obedience of blessing. 
You'll never find the favor of God on your life as you desire. Now, when I talk about the favor of God, I'm not talking about finances or wealth or riches or material goods. I'm talking about the fact that when I'm living in the favor of God, I'm covered in his grace. I'm surrounded in his mercy. His loving kindness is new to me every single morning. I am washed in the blood of the lamb. My name is written in the lamb's book of life. I have a hope, a future, and a destiny that no man can steal or take away from me because I choose to obey. And I live in the blessing of God. Church, if you can hear this this morning, it'll revolutionize your life. But so many times, we come square up against something that we don't want to do. And rather than submitting, and hearing the word of Jesus, if you love me, keep my commands, we resist. We rebel. We become stiff-necked. And we say, that's not for me. I'm not going to do that. I don't think that's of God. Open your heart and hear what God is saying. If you love me, keep my commandments. Stop substituting your pitiful service for the joy of obedience to my command. And see what I will do when I open the windows of heaven and begin pouring out upon you my favor in ways you've never dreamt nor imagined. See, when I understand kingdom living, I understand I live as a man under authority. I am not the final answer. I am not the guy that's in charge. Someone said, well, you're the pastor of this church. It's because God placed me here. Because this is the role he's given me to fulfill in the kingdom. It's not one that I chose. He chose. I had an encounter last Wednesday night with a guy who got upset with me because I didn't want him doing something he shouldn't have been doing in the house of God. Listen, I live under authority, and because I live under authority, I understand how to exercise authority. But if I don't live under authority, I don't exercise proper authority. That's the problem with many, many people standing in pulpits today. They just want to be the authority. Come on, it's time to get over that. I've seen it so many times through the years of the pastor that people will come in. They'll say to me, hey, this is who I am. This is what I've done. That's wonderful. Let us get to know you. I want to see your heart. I want to see, are you a person who understands obedience to the commands? Who understands how authority flows in the church of Jesus Christ? Who knows that Jesus is the king? Or are you trying to build your own kingdom? Are you trying to develop your own following? Hear me, folks, it happens every day because we don't understand the command is to do what Jesus told us to do. And if we love him, we will do what he's told us to do. You see, when we're involved in obeying Jesus Christ, when we love him so much, we'll do whatever he asks us, whatever his word says, we'll follow his commands. Then we find a shift happening in our life. It's a shift that moves us away from the natural carnal mind and nature to being spiritually minded and spiritually natured. It's a shift that causes us to say, that old frequent sin that's followed me around for 110 years, it's dying today. That chain is being broken today. Never again will I allow that place or prominence in my life because my priority is doing what God's commanded me to do because I love Him. Listen, folks, I know that addictive behavior can be tough to overcome. And I'm not saying to you that everybody in an instant can be set free. But I am saying to you that if you will determine no longer from this day forward, am I a drug addict, am I an alcoholic, am I a sex addict, but from today forward, I love him, I'm going to do what he's commanded me to do, then you will see that frequent sin broken from your life. You can be changed. You can be delivered. You can be set free. But it all starts with you saying, I love him. And because I love him, I'm going to do what he's asked me to do. I'm going to do what he's commanded me to do. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said it this way. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. We don't hear this scripture much, do we? Kind of hard. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
So how does he qualify that? Who will enter the kingdom of heaven? He tells us in the next phrase. But he that does the will of my Father. What's the will of the Father? If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the will of the Father. Many will say to me in that day, he's talking about when we stand before him. Many will say to me in that day, by the way, there is a very real judgment. You need to be aware of that. We will all stand before Jesus Christ and give account. Now, if you're a born-again believer living for him, you're not, your salvation isn't in question. He's looking at what did you do for me after you came to know me? How did you enhance or build or advance the kingdom after you became a part of it? Or were you one of those pretty folks just sitting on a seat doing nothing to build the kingdom of God? All of us will stand before the beam of seat of Christ, not to be judged for our salvation or our eternal destiny, but what we did for Him. What we did with what He gave us and how that advanced His kingdom. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Your name? In Your name we cast out devils, and in Your name we did many wonderful works. And Jesus said, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Wow, what a hard saying. Why? Because if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Someone says, well, you're getting a little judgy. No, I'm not. I'm just reading the word. See, truth becomes inconvenient when it doesn't line up with our philosophy. Maybe it's not the truth that's in error, it's our philosophy that's in error. Maybe it's not the Word of God that's wrong, maybe it's us that is wrong. And perhaps we should re-examine our hearts and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? He's saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. You'll find a series of parables in Luke chapter 6, it's verses 39 through 49. He said, how can the blind lead the blind? They'll both fall in the ditch. And then he said, if you see a brother with a splinter in his eye, first, I want you to notice this, first, first, take the beam out of your eye. Then, help your brother with a splinter in his eye. See, we need to understand, when we live in community, when we do what God asks us to do, we have a responsibility to one another. But our responsibility is first, our relationship with God. First, take the beam out of your eye, then take the splinter out of your brother's eye. We invert that, don't we? We sure do. I see something wrong with you. I want to rip it out right now. And we come and get in your face about it. Listen, that's not what God's telling us to do. He's saying, deal with your own life first. And then with the other person. Help them because you have dealt with it yourself. And see what God will do in you and through you. Obedience, when we continue to read the scriptures, always brings fruit. Always brings evidence that we are living in obedience. You see that in verses 43 through 45 of Luke chapter 6. It always brings obedience. It's absolutely impossible to be a born-again believer living under the kingdom authority and not bear fruit. What's that fruit look like? Maybe you need to read John. Hear the, hear the story of the vine dresser and what he does for the branches that he wants to bring fruit into the vineyard. What does it look like? It means we bear fruit for Him. It means His reflection, His image becomes obvious and evident in our lives. Something changes within us on the inside that's reflected on the outside. We hear that bear fruit and we immediately think, oh, we're supposed to be bringing people in and seeing them saved. First, deal with the beam in your own eye. Then, deal with the splinter in your brother's eye. See, until your relationship is right with God and you understand my primary objective is to obey His commands because I love Him, you will never bear fruit for eternity. Never. Not going to happen. We have to come to the place where we understand my responsibility 
is to do what He's asked me to do. Someone said, this is really legalistic. No, it's not. I haven't given you a list of things you have to do, and I won't ever do that. Because that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to challenge you to understand Jesus is saying in the waning moments of his life, the most important window we see in Scripture when he's pouring into his disciples after three and a half years of constant ministry, he stops and he says, if you love me, do what I've told you to do. It's the most important thing in that passage, in that particular period of time, before he goes to the cross, if you love me. Do what I've asked you to do. You see, we know we can bear fruit, and we are bearing fruit, when we aren't comfortable living in the surroundings we were once comfortable in. When we aren't comfortable doing the things that we once did, it shows us we're bearing fruit for the kingdom and moving toward Jesus Christ. You see, we can't come to the place where we are saying we're living under kingdom authority, but yet we're giving acquiescence, we're acknowledging them on Sunday, but living like the devil the rest of the week. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. Listen, you cannot do what the flesh wants you to do and be pleasing to God. Can I say it any clearer than that? I don't need to draw you a picture. You're intelligent people. You understand that there has to come a time in your life as a believer in Jesus Christ where you forsake the things of old and you embrace the things of God and you say obeying you is more important to me than following those things that once brought me pleasure. What's the scripture say? It says the pleasures of sin are for a season. I'm not going to tell you that you can have fun living in the world and living the high life. You will. It'll be a lot of fun. You'll enjoy it. But you will never be fulfilled. You will never be content. And you will never understand what God wants for your life when you live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. That's who I'm talking to this morning. Fence straddlers. Those who still think, I can somehow slide in. God's calling you to obedience today. He's calling you to forsake the old, embrace the new, and understand five times he said, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. When we live under kingdom authority, the first evidence of that is we're living in obedience. We're doing what Jesus wants us to do. We're following Him, and we're allowing Him to be first and foremost in our lives. We're doing exactly what He's asking us to do. And then we realize, well, come on, you need to hear this and write it down. Obeying God is not a burden. Obeying God is not a burden. Rather, it lifts the burden. And it allows me to live in joy and in peace and in security. It allows me to allow His love to flow through me to touch those around me when I choose to live in obedience. It's not a burden. Every time somebody told you you've got to do this, 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 and this in order to please God, you know what they were doing? They were putting you under a burden. They were shackling you. They were convincing you it's about rules and regulations and rituals. It's not. It's about simply loving Him. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do what I've asked you to do. If you love me, if you love me, it's about an eyes are closed. If you love me. I know this isn't an easy word to accept, to digest. I know it's not palatable. I know it doesn't make you want to sing and shout and dance. But it will make you closer to God. If you'll hear and if you'll heed. So as we're sitting in this room this morning, the musicians are coming back. I'm going to start playing a song that says, Change my heart, O God. As we're sitting in this place today, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Your response will happen in just a moment. But I'm asking you to take this moment to examine yourself. Examine your own heart. 
And to ask yourself, am I really living in obedience to Jesus Christ? Because listen, when we do, this is what's going to happen. He transforms us. He transforms our relationships. He transforms our homes. He transforms our workplace. You see, when we have God's perspective, everything begins to change around us. Because we've learned, if I love Him, I'm going to obey Him. And when I obey Him, it opens the door of blessing and favor to fall upon my life. It allows God to cover me. It allows, as David the psalmist said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So examine your heart. Ask yourself, do I really obey Him? Do I really love Him? By doing what He's asked me to do. Because even yet today, obedience is better than sacrifice. And rebellion is still like the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is still a form of idolatry. Father, across this room this morning, speak to the hearts of these individuals. For those that are watching online around the world, God, speak to their hearts right now. I pray that you would show them by the power of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, changes that need to occur in our lives. In Jesus' name. Stand to your feet with me. As Tom begins to sing, God's talking to you this morning. He's talking to you. He's saying it's time to make some changes and be obedient to me. As he begins to sing this song, change my heart, oh God, step out and come. This is your moment, your time. God's going to do a work in you today that will change your forever. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 1030, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.